Hello, everybody. Sage Rosenfels here for the Sage Rosenfels Experience on the Iowa Everywhere Network. This podcast is made possible by the great folks over at Channel Seed. Today, I have on a very unique and special guest. Jake Kendall is his name. Uh, Jake and I grew up together in Makoka, Iowa, have been friends uh, since really Little League, uh, into uh, T-ball and, and uh, in, in middle school and, of course, throughout high school. Uh, he now owns a, a couple uh, Culver's around the state of Iowa and a couple other states. And uh, we have some great stories talking about Hawkeye. He's a big Hawkeye fan, so Hawkeye football, Hawkeye uh, basketball. Of course, him watching me as the Iowa State quarterback, even though he was a Hawkeye fan. So uh, we got into all sorts of uh, discussions today. It's really, really fun and, and hope you guys really enjoy the, the interview and the conversation. From the Channel Seed Studios, Channel Seed Studios. This, this is the Sage Rosenfels Experience, exclusively on Iowa Everywhere. Just jumping right into it here, uh, I have a special guest today, my friend, Jake Kendall. Jake and I really grew up together, not really grew up together I guess sort of grew up together from sort of like Little League on. Uh, I grew up in a small town called Andrew, Iowa. Jake grew up in Makoka, Iowa. And we became friends, I guess, through uh, through Little League initially. And then, you know, throughout our high school career, uh, Jake lives in Marion, Iowa. Is that right? Not Cedar Rapids, but Marion, uh, yes. Iowa. And yeah, um, sense, right. yeah a, a part of my show, I wanted to have all sorts of random guests, and, and Jake definitely is a random guest. Jake Kendall, uh, thanks for coming on today. Uh, I appreciate it, and, and your memory is, uh, as always, accurate. Um, I, I, do, I do remember uh, the first time um, that I maybe informally met you, um, I would, I think it's T-Ball, actually. Um, you know, a group from Andrew came over, and, and that was the first time that uh, I even... Uh, knew of, of who you were, your family, uh, more so than just you. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a etched, uh, memory in my, my brain, uh, of seeing you play shortstop, uh, in T-ball. Well, the, the world was very different back then. And we're going to get into that, uh, cause you and I played multiple sports together, but let's start off there with baseball. Um, we yeah, met probably in T-ball. My guess is, you know, nowadays you see all these kids and everyone has like full on uniform, everyone has a bat, everyone has a bag, everyone has, you know, everything. And back in those days, I had sweatpants, I had a t-shirt, uh, fairly sure passed me down baseball shoes from my brothers who pr we probably got like a second hand store. To be so I probably had them like fourth hand, uh, my, my, my t-ball shoes, uh, probably no hat. Um, and we had like probably two to three decent bats on our t-ball team uh you know very different world than it was now uh one story i really wanted to to ask you about um was we were on a, an all-star team i think it was like nine year old ten year old all-star team i think this is now in the little league uh we were driving to savannah illinois uh for an all-star uh game and it's one of the first sort of times we probably spent time together like in a, in a car i think um but we stopped at a Casey's gas station. Uh, parents got uh, uh, your parents got some ice uh, for the sodas in the back in the cooler. Can you can you tell our audience what happened uh, okay. over the next uh, forty five minutes to hour? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I can remember this story uh, a, a little bit. And and by the way, you were right about the sweatpants. Your sweatpants were were pulled up past the calves. Oh yeah, uh, playing playing shortstop um, to to give everybody a good visual, but. Yeah, we stopped to, to fill up the cooler, right? And um, the ice, as it always is, is all one big block. And uh, we had to bang it around a little bit in that process. Slit, put a little, very small slit in the uh, the Pepsi can. Caffeine-free, uh, in fact. Remember it quite well because it was on my face for the next hour, um, roughly. Um, I, I decided to uh, put the Pepsi can with the small slit uh, up to my face and drink yeah and uh of course the way that uh science works uh, my lip then went into the can um and it closed up and so i had a, a soda can on my face uh, we had to go and and get uh removed at the doctor's office before we could then drive to savannah and play which we did and and i'm pretty sure we won that day uh from from my 
recollection it was uh yeah your your dad or your mom dumping the ice into this um uh cooler and one of them gets slit and 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 pepsi starts shooting out of it and so you take it and you start sucking on it we're like oh this is great you know it's, it was very we we're all it went from like laughing and having a good time and like sort of funny to all of a sudden this thing is stuck on your lip your lip had like gone inside of it just a little bit uh, next thing you know, when we can't get it off, we had uh, uh, opened it up and taken all the uh, uh, <laughs> taken all the uh, Pepsi out. But we knew if they tried to like sort of rip it off, you would probably uh, rip put a big gash in your. Yeah, lip. I, I still to this day um, don't understand how my my half my lip didn't come off. Um, yeah. I mean, they had to cut it with with surgical scissors and, and cut the aluminum while it was on my lip. And yeah, that, I'm glad it's a good story today. Yeah. You and I played baseball throughout, all the way through our, our senior year. Uh, we also played basketball together. Um, a, a couple uh, questions about basketball. All right. Um, you were the first person that I knew that knew somebody famous. When I was, uh, when you and I were like in middle school, uh, really before that, uh, uh, you had gone to an Iowa basketball camp. I'm not sure what, what year that was. But through that Iowa basketball camp, you got to know Brad Lowhouse, uh, you know, one of the all time great three point shooters slash centers, uh, I guess, or power forwards in, in, in Iowa history. Uh, tell me that story about, you know, meeting a, a Hawkeye basketball player as a kid and, and then getting to sort of know him uh, over over that time. Yeah. And, and Brad was before his time, uh, as we talk about the NBA. A great player, but uh, he he would fit even better in today's game, in my opinion. Um, but but you're right. Um, was lucky enough to become friends um, while he was a junior senior at the University of Iowa, which um, you can kind of remember that that was those were the glory years. Uh, right when Tom Davis came back um, from Boston College, uh, right after George Raveling left, and and they had such great success. And so not only did I get to know Brad, who was a great individual, I got to experience that uh, at the University of Iowa, you know, um, road games, uh, letting me in the hotel room, kind of hanging out with the players, those types of things, going to basketball camps, you know, B.J. Armstrong, Ed Horton, Gary Wright. So much fun. Roy uh, Marble. Roy Marble. Roy Marble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still still remember very well watching a scrimmage and Roy Marble just completely taking me out uh, on the side of the court. And uh, as he took me out, he was, of course, talented enough to to lift me, protect me and, and carry me the whole way. And and he, he set me back down and I was just full of sweat and I just sat there and, and stargazed. Right. Uh, but that that experience and then, you know, the, the 12 years in the NBA. He allowed me to uh, to tag along in so many different things. And in my experiences, I share with my boys today and uh, so lucky, you know, uh, time spending with Larry Bird, being in the, the old Boston Garden, uh, going in the locker room, sitting in the New York Knicks locker room, listening to Patrick Ewing. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Pretty fortunate. Brad, Brad, Brad's a great guy. Two of my. Uh as I'm just thinking about now, two of my first experiences uh, around like division one college athletes or pro athletes uh, were really through you. Uh, this, this first one, I think we we're in eighth grade. Uh, we drove to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you, my dad, or your dad, my, uh, you and me, and we drove to Milwaukee and, and they were playing, I'm going to say the uh, Charlotte Hornets, Muggsy Bogues and Alonzo Mourning, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks who had, you're going to know the, the, the Dan Shays, of course, Brad. Um, I don't remember all the other guys. Oh, well, well you, you can't forget Ricky Pierce, Ricky uh, Pierce. Alvin Robinson. Uh, so it's just, yeah, the, 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 the Bucks before the Bucks. It was a cool yeah. team. So we pull into this neighborhood in like suburban Milwaukee somewhere with all these big houses. And, and you know, we walk into this house and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Brad and his wife and they have a, he's got this massage table. That's like, does it by itself? I'm thinking this is the coolest thing ever. NBA player. We go to the game and, uh, a wonderful experience, uh, again, to gain to sort of know him for a short amount of my time, but for your time, a lengthy amount. And, and by, by the way, is, is not, we're, we're going to get into this whole Iowa state, Iowa thing, Jake 
and his family, major Iowa Hawkeye fans. And, and really in Eastern Iowa, especially during the 80s and, and 90s, it was really Hawkeye country completely over there. And it seemed like the only Iowa Staters were, you know, our, our friend's dads who might have been a farmer or maybe an engineer or something uh, had, had gone to Iowa State. But, you, you know, a true Hawkeye family, you guys also had season tickets. And this is my other experience with, with sort of being around college and pro athletes with you was my first ever Division One football game was going to uh, watch the Hawkeyes with you. We sat and you guys had tickets in the north end zone. And I believe it's like it was like the first row uh, uh, in Kinnick behind uh, those seats that sort of went down to the field, which I think all the recruits sort of sat in. Yeah, it, it techni technically on the ticket, row zero. <laughs> row zero. Yeah, so which... we, we, our feet were on like the walkway where people walking past us all the time. I, I can't, and the band was to our right, uh, I, I feel like. But we went to a game, the first game was Iowa uh, Northwestern, I believe. Uh, Merton Hanks had an interception. Um, in that football game. And so, yeah, so my, my first experience in Kinnick wasn't as a as an Iowa State player. Uh, it was, you know, going to a game with you in eighth grade. Talk to me about growing up a Hawkeye fan and, and what that what that what that what that has meant to you and your family. Yeah. And 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 you know, you forgot to mention the Mike Tyson punch out arcade game that Brad also had in Milwaukee, which, right. which don't get me wrong, the massage table's still pretty cool, but that Mike Tyson punch out game was uh was was pretty good uh you know iowa iowa athletics is the only thing we knew um you know and, and that was that's awesome uh, still is today right i'm a huge fan um have a little bit maybe different or better perspective uh now than than what i did then but um you know and and, and then only adding to getting the the experiences for instance that you shared with with brad and things just made it makes it that much more special but um you know being in the eastern part of the state um, you know, clearly we, we had an idea about Iowa State, but didn't pay as much attention with the different conferences and things like that. And they just um, weren't on TV back then. I mean, Eastern yeah. Iowa, the Quad Cities, we were pretty much getting Iowa Hawkeye basketball and football. And Iowa State was really not on our radar. We didn't get the Des Moines TV stations back then on yeah. really basic cable or, or just regular antenna TV, which is what we had. Yeah. And, and, and like you said, I mean, the, the individuals we surrounded ourselves with you would very, very seldom run into an Iowa State um, individual, right? And, and like you said, if it was, it was maybe the farming or engineering background or something like that. Certainly different than what it is today. And, you know, as I still live in eastern Iowa, um, completely different, you know, and, and that's obviously says a lot to how things have changed, but how Iowa State has continued to, to evolve. If you're the head coach of Iowa football, Kirk Ferentz retires. They named Jake Kendall the head coach. Yeah, makes what sense. Do you, what do you do? You've been a you know family season ticket holder for what almost forty years, probably. Yeah. What do you immediately do different that maybe has uh, not been what Iowa football has been for the last forty years? What what do, what do you change about the program? Yeah, and and, and so this this is fun. This is um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a traditionalist. Um, generally speaking. And so my answer to your question is I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a whole lot. Um, you know, in my opinion, what makes being an Iowa fan so fun is the highs and the lows, the, the expectations of, of what we always deal with the, we're never quite good enough. Um, you know, I think that's, that's part of the entertainment aspect that I love. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it would be like, um, to have a team to where you only had the highest expectation. Um, you know, and, and to, to feel the pain, that's what makes being a fan so much, you know, more fun in my opinion. So, you know, I, I wouldn't change a whole lot. I love, I love, I love the fact that, that Iowa represents a brand, uh, in my opinion, a culture, um, of, of, you know, the people of Iowa, you know, hardworking and, and, and developmental and like, I, I couldn't imagine what the, in the football program would be like if, if that wasn't who they represented. Um, and so there'd be a, a few tweaks, you know, um, but uh, for the most part, I would try to keep what's made Iowa successful in my mind uh, as, as close to possible as what it is today. Would you try to hire me as the offensive coordinator? Oh, absolutely. I, try, I tried um, whatever years ago, right? You were the first call I made. Now, nobody, that didn't go anywhere. I don't know.
the, the uh, yeah, for years, Jake has been like, you know, it would be great for have you over here running that San Francisco offense or running that, uh, you know, Green Bay Packers offense uh, that Matt LaFleur is in uh, over here in Iowa City. And I'm like, I don't know. I, one, I don't know if I want to do that. And two, I don't know how that would really stand with my sort of Iowa State history, of course. It'd be a very unusual situation to have an Iowa State quarterback end up being the Iowa offensive coordinator. I mean, of course, Dan McCartney did that, right? Great Iowa player, uh, coached at Iowa for a long, long time, a part of those Hayden Fry teams, and then boom, you know, over to Iowa State for for his run as the, the Cyclone head coach. And and you could definitely tell there, of course, he was had the, the uh, allegiance to Iowa State because he was the head coach, but there was just like, you could tell he like loved Iowa and sort of hated Iowa at the same, or try to convince us that he he didn't like the Iowa program anymore, even though we, we all knew like, you know, he grew up with that program and uh, it's not, a, it wasn't a, uh, an easy thing for him to probably have to talk some smack about the Hawkeyes being that that was his team growing up and his team uh, throughout his sort of his, his life. But now he's competing against them against recruits. And so you can't say good things about your sort of, sort of your enemy. And so he had to, to, you know, talk down a little bit about the Hawkeyes. And so that would, that would, that would be like a, a, a spot that I wouldn't want to be in. I wouldn't want to, you know, try to say bad things about Iowa state or Matt Campbell or, or, or whatever, uh, just, you know, to, to coach those Hawkeyes. So, uh, you know, it, as, as I've said many times over the years, I grew up an Iowa fan. I, I did. Uh, Iowa state was not on my radar uh, really until Dan McCarney brought me in for a, uh, for a recruiting visit, um, middle of my senior year, I was probably of, of our recruiting class. I'm going to go ahead and assume I was the last guy to get a, a scholarship offer. It was like right before Christmas signing day was like, you know, six weeks away or something like that, or maybe less. And I finally get a, my only scholarship offer to Iowa state, which at the time might've been like the worst program, one of the worst programs in division one football. Um, but I was looking at it as like, you know, a great opportunity to play in a major conference, get my school paid for, and maybe one of these days I'll, you know, I'll be able to start my my senior year, my junior year, and never thought that my career would end up what it was, you know, professionally. But you know, I going back to it, I, I really grew up a Hawkeye fan. I had a Iowa jacket growing up. My grandfather was a wrestler, uh, as you know, and, and huge Hawkeye fan. He would go to those uh, the Big Ten wrestling championships or just the Iowa duels. Um, he would call them the choke eyes, uh, because that was sort of, you know, they, in the biggest game of the year, they just always would seem to choke or, or, um, uh, or in the big bowl game when they're in the Rolls bowl, you know, and they, they try, they try trick plays and they'd screw it up or something. So that was my, my grandfather, sort of like a love hate relationship with the Hawkeyes, but he was a Hawkeye and I grew up a Hawkeye. Most of our friends were Hawkeyes and but your family of all my sort of hometown friends were definitely sort of the most Iowa uh, black and gold, uh, of anybody. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, we had the, the rotary phone with the, uh, the, the, the handset was yellow and the, the rotary part was black, right? Um, the, the cord was, I think yellow. So yeah, we, we were, uh, we, we bled, uh, black, black and gold. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, you, you talk about Dan McCartney and I know I shared this story with you once. Um, yeah, he, he came back for a game uh, in Iowa City where he was being honored, right? Um, this is after he had retired, so, so fairly recently. And I'm walking into the game, and I see him, you know, and, and of course, after, after a couple of tailgating beers or whatever, um, I had enough uh, confidence just to run up to him and, and, and pat him on the back and say, hey, my, my friend Sage, um, you know, speaks so highly of you and quite honestly owes you for the opportunity um, that, that you gave him because I was Dan, I was his receiver in high school. And my, my greatest accomplishment as your receiver in high school was not blocking you from some form of scholarship, because that was a very real liability that I carried. Yeah. Um, so, but, but he turned and man, he, he, he said some great words, had a couple of great stories. I mean, he just very genuine individual and spoke very highly of you. And it's just a pretty cool experience. Yeah. The other sport that we played together, as you said, you, you were one of my receivers in high school, but eighth grade, you were not one of my receivers. Eighth no. grade, there were two quarterbacks that went out. There were two players that went off of quarterbacks in the eighth grade. On the A team was not Sage Rosenfels. On the A team was, was Jake Kendall, and I was the B team quarterback. Uh, talk to me about 
when you're in eighth grade, when we're in eighth grade, and you were the starting quarterback in eighth grade, I, I obviously you didn't know that you were starting ahead of a, a future Division One and NFL quarterback. You didn't know that at that time. Um, but uh, the next year, you moved to wide receiver. Talking about what it felt like to play quarterback just for that one year, to be like the leader of the offense, the, really the leader of our our team. Um, and then why you made that transition to receiver, you know, going yeah. forward. And, and yeah, I'm proud, proud to share this story, uh, you know, beating you out in eighth grade, which um, the beating you out part was I got in line first. Um, and, and then I just held that position. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting, Sage, I, I, your progression, you talked about expectations, um, you know, growing up with you, being friends with you. I don't know that it ever dawned on me or, or a lot of us, you know, how talented you were. You know, there were there were bits and pieces, certainly not in eighth grade. Right. Um, and, and, and going back to the eighth grade discussion, you know, you you threw three interceptions in a B game. You know, I think your very first B game. Right. I was the 18 quarterback. And, and then the very first B game, which only played three quarters, you had three interceptions. And I was I felt pretty good that, that, that I'm going to be the 18 quarterback for the rest of the year after that. But you know, I, go back to, I, you know, I don't know that any of us knew how talented and the abilities that you had. There were glimpses. Um, and I have, you know, just as the first time I, I met you or saw you, I have glimpses in, in our athletic careers that that showed that and, and finally kind of hit home, you know, um, in football. And ironically, it wasn't when doing something playing quarterback. Um, we threw you in, in at defensive back and all of a sudden you had two or three picks that game. And it's like, whoa, wait a second. This, this guy has a little something special that, you know, is different than everybody else on the field. Um, or, or baseball, uh, when you hit three home runs back to back to back, um, that, that was, those were, those were two times to where, and I didn't know if it was just because I was so close to you, um, or just in the middle of everything that we were doing. Um, but those are the two times where I know I, I personally took a step back and said, this guy's different um, and has the ability. And so, um, yeah, the eighth grade, eighth grade story, um, I, I make sure to tell certainly my kids um, how I was um, the better quarterback at, at the time. Well, one, you were the better quarterback, but two, uh, it wasn't that you were just in line first, uh, just so we're on the same. I didn't have my physical turned in which means I had to stand over um, by the fence and watch everyone practice. And so then practice number two, when I show up, I'm, I'm already the, the B team quarterback. So you did beat me out, but I sort of beat myself out, which is a, just, a, it's a great sort of lesson to learn. You can't play if you haven't done the basics first and have my physical in uh, yet. So then there was no competition and I was relegated to the B team quarterback, which for me was, well, what else can I do? And I ended up being the sort of starting free safety on that team because I was like, well, I, you know, I'm a, a baseball player and a basketball player. I, I don't want to be in the action. I don't want to be a linebacker or a lineman or something. I want to be back here where there's, there's the least amount of contact. And so basically that turned into me just diving at uh, our, our friend's ankles and trying to tackle them in practice and just hanging on for dear life. That was pretty much my, my free safety capabilities, but I found a way to get on the field uh, in, in, in one way or another, you were also my holder, uh, in, in high school as the receiver with the best hands that you we, we yeah. to hold and we kicked a lot of extra points and a few field goals uh, uh, here and there. Talk to me about the multi-sport athlete thing that we had growing up in a smaller town. Makoka is about 6,000, 6,500. And then now you're in Marion Cedar Rapids and you know I'm in Omaha. Tell me about like how you see the difference between that era of how sports was and what it is now with most kids that, you know, by the time they're in seventh grade, they have pretty much narrowed down to one, maybe two sports. I mean, whether it's actually athletics or whether it's some sort of competitive cheer and dance, people narrow things down really, really uh, quickly now. Tell me about what, as your experience, what would you rather have this sort of focusing on this one sport or being a three or four sport high school athlete. Yeah. I mean, no question. Um, you know, the multiple sports and the opportunity, you know, I do two, I have two boys and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of times I, I love Marion, but um, you know, the opportunity to grow up in a smaller, smaller town and, and participate, whether you're good enough or not, you're participating. I, I 
that's that's extremely important. But you know, I'd be curious, Sage. I I, I don't know that football was your best sport in high school. Um, you know, I think you've maybe you've spoken about this, but you know, I I would argue baseball or basketball, um, but I would probably argue baseball was your your best sport. Um, in and with that being said, if, if, if you would have been in an environment to where, you know, bigger city or, or the greater focus on just one sport, do you get a chance to play football at Iowa State in the NFL? I, 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 think, I think you could argue no. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really about the experience, um, you know, and, and I think you're a, as good an example that I can think of. Uh, you know, you were good in so many different sports. We didn't have – we didn't have we – we had great coaches as far as – people, you know, and humans in, in, in their efforts, they didn't have the expertise to, to teach you to become a division one quarterback, for instance. Um, you know, so you had to go figure it out. And I think that's what playing multiple sports teaches you. You got to go figure it out and, yeah. and let your natural abilities and your drive, you know, take you from there. Most of that figuring out was like watching, you know, Michael Jordan or watching Ryan Sandberg, uh, uh, or whoever it might be, uh, you know, Walter Payton growing up and then trying to emulate them, you know, in the driveway, emulate them in the backyard, emulate them on the practice field or on the basketball court. And I, I'm a I'm a huge advocate of multi-sport um, because I think what it does is not just, it, it as you said, it sort of, you have to solve problems yourself. You have to figure it out yourself. Uh, but on top of it, you have to be around different people. The football team is very different than the basketball team is very different than the tennis team. I played tennis. You played golf in the spring and different than the baseball team. And, and, and by the way, I love the fact that Iowa has four seasons. Almost every state that I've lived in only has three school seasons. And I always felt that being around tennis players and be around football players, which are sort of like the opposite kids in the school sometimes makes you more well-rounded person in general. Uh, but as an athlete, it makes you more well-rounded. Um, how how am I going to win this game? How am I going to win this match? I've been in tennis matches where I'm down 8-2 and found a way to come back slowly but surely and, and win 11-9, right? And how for me that translated into when I got into football, finding ways to win that aren't – because because games are never just like you get the lead and you, you just – win every time you have to find ways here and there to like get a little competitive advantage to, to get just a, just an edge uh, to, to find a ways uh, to victory. So I wish that I wish that m there was more allowance and more push by the coaches uh, by just the sort of the systems in general to have kids play more sports. I know they're not going to be quite as good in that one sport that you coach. But I feel like as when we're talking about kids here, high school kids, middle school kids, elementary school kids, I'm always into this whole child. We're talking about the whole person here, not just the one aspect of this person. And I always felt the multi-sport athlete creates a better sort of whole person individual, which then you learn more lessons in multi-sports to then as you go in through life, you have uh, experiences and sort of advantages over the other people who just focused on one thing. On the flip side, I will say, if I just would have focused on baseball or if I just would have focused on playing quarterback and I would have gone to quarterback camps and all sorts of private training and uh, got some like early uh, coaching from, from people who had played in the, at the professional or college level, I would have had probably an advantage uh, from like a physical standpoint, I would have learned how to throw better and been, been more accurate and more, more fine tuned. And or or in baseball, I could have probably add a couple more miles an hour to my fastball or learned how to throw a curveball from someone other than my older brother. And maybe that would have given me an advantage too. But but overall, when you leave high school at 18 years old, I feel like you're 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 missing something that you would have had with the with the multi sport experience. You know, and, and you, you brought up something um, just to, to reference a story you told earlier, the, the day that I had the pop can on my face. You know, we, we did go to Savannah and play and, and your brother, Jaffa, did teach you a curveball and it was amazing. Um, so, so amazing that the, the folks the, the, that ran the tournament came to you during the game and said, son, you got to stop throwing the curveball. One, because nobody can hit it. 
and two, you're going to throw your arm out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they actually, the they actually umpire said you can't throw any more curveballs. And we're like, is this, where's, where's, where in the rule book is this? And, and yeah, when you have two older brothers, I mean, that's all you do in the backyard is like try to throw a knuckleball, try to throw a curveball. And when the older brothers, of course, they're learning first. And then so I'm like the guinea pig at the bottom who's learning all the all those things, good and bad from older brothers, by the way. You learn a lot of bad things too. You know, when you're in eighth grade, they're seniors in high school doing different things than you uh, in, in eighth grade. So not um, just athletics, right? Yeah, no. not, not, not just athletics. Uh, so after high school, we have our high school experience. Uh, you go to the University of Iowa, not a surprise. All right. Um, how was it during that era? Because you really, this is the end of the Hayden Fry era. Yeah. When Iowa, the first couple of years were in school, you know, they had Tavian Banks and Sed Shaw and Tim Dwight and, and Matt Sherman. But then, of course, at the end and, and the whole time, of course, your, your high school buddies over at Iowa State and we're, we're pretty terrible. Right. So but then the, the tides turned. Uh, uh, Hayden had a bad year. They, they, they transitioned from him to Kirk Ferentz. Uh, and now I was bad. And then we sort of flip it around over to Iowa State. And, and of course, my senior, we go nine and three. How was that being a student at Iowa and going from this like sort of perennial Big Ten challenger? And of course, when we were growing up watching Chuck Long and, and ranked number one in the country and going to Rose Bowls to this. Now you're at Iowa and, and the Hawkeyes aren't very good anymore. Uh, how was that experience for you as a, just like an Iowa student? Yeah, so so. 96 to 2000 um, is the, the year span you're talking about in, in your um, Iowa athletics, basketball and football were not very exciting. Um, and, and thankfully I had a, enough other things to keep me occupied in college. Um, but, you know, looking back, we did not, I did not get blessed with the glory years of, of Iowa athletics. Um, you know, in, in Iowa state, you're right. It, it, it crazy um, how the tides had turned and, and ultimately let it led you know you playing uh in Kinnick and me watching from the stands and in that emotional um change for me and and getting to experience that was uh something that that I'll always remember in 2000 my senior year uh we went to Kinnick how was that were you I, I think you were at the game if I recall right yeah. Um, yeah. I, I talked to you after the game how was that experience, you know, your your Hawkeyes who I think the year before they maybe they won one in 10 or, or two and nine or something uh, are, are my junior year. Um, that senior year, uh, my senior year, how is that experience being in the stadium, uh, the stadium that, again, like, as I said, we you brought me to my first Hawkeye football game. Um, and at the end of that game, we're up three, and, and and we run a naked bootleg to the right in that northeast end zone. You got it. And I and I dove into the pylon for the sort of the game, you know, clinching touchdown. We go up ten with you know a couple of minutes left. Uh, how was that experience for you as one of my friends, but also like an Iowa fan, but also like knowing the significance of where that play happened, uh, and uh, just all of it. How was that for you? It, it was awesome, um, right? Three phases. Um, I went into the game, uh, you know, it, it helped that Iowa wasn't very good. Um, but I went into the game fully content, confident that I was rooting for my, my buddy, right? And then as the game went on, uh, that emotion uh, of, of my connection to the University of Iowa, right? And, and I would find myself fighting the, the who, who am I really rooting for here, right? Um, but then, you know, before that play, but as the game was getting closer and closer to the end, then my my true emotion of rooting for my buddy overcame my connection to the University of Iowa. And so from an emotional perspective in that game, it it, it hit everything. And in the way it ended and um, my true joy of seeing you get to do that, get to experience that um, pretty, pretty neat experience. Yeah. Well, after college, we went our separate ways. Uh, I went to, of course, you know, getting brave for the NFL and the draft. And my world changes. I get drafted by Washington and I'm then Miami. You had a different path, different journey. Uh, if I recall, you were in the golf industry for, for a hot second because um, uh, you were a good golf. You grew up in the, the, the golf course and the nine holer in, in Makoka to growing up. Uh, then you worked for Cerner, I believe. Is that right? In Kansas City. Absolutely. Um, 
And then your family got into Culver's. Culver's, the great fast food chain based in Wisconsin. They got the butter burgers. Uh, they got the cheese curds. Uh, talk to me about, I want to talk about Culver's for a part of this podcast today. Talk to me about how your family got into Culver's and then where you guys have expanded and where, where you guys are now. Yeah. And, and um, interestingly enough, Sage, and I don't, I don't know um, how well you remember this, but, uh, you know, you just had a birthday and my folks were the same age as you and I when they got into that venture. Oh. And so you try to try to wrap your head around that that risk, that adventure that they took, you know, obviously makes it that much more exciting. I mean, they're, they're two individuals that grew up where their parents owned a, a business in small town Lakota, right? So it was just in, in, into who they were and, and what they, they wanted to do ultimately. And so once, once their children got through high school, they said, now's the time. And they literally sold off everything, put everything that they could towards this financially, emotionally, and said, we're going to go do this. And, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of risk, a lot of, a lot of, you know, hard work. Um, they were blessed with a, a franchise Culver's that that aligned with their their core values. Um, you know, that's certainly not the case. There's a lot of franchises, certainly a lot of restaurants that that come and go. Um, and so th they walked into that with zero restaurant experience. Um, thankfully, yeah, your dad growing up, I believe, I mean, your parents had multiple jobs growing up. But one of those jobs was like he was traveling sales for like a glass company for a while. Uh, was Is that right? Or. Was yeah, uh, flooring. Flooring. Uh, but, but, but you're right. My my mom did glass. I mean, my mom worked at Walmart. My dad. I mean, it was it was anything to 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 financially get us by in in small town Makokota, keep the family so with my you know their son could play all the multiple sports or whatever it is. But then once once that time hit, um, you know they they had made those sacrifices. It was time for them to go do their own venture. Um, yeah, just again, uh, 45 years old. Uh, I, I can't imagine doing that now in, in my life. Um, midlife change. Midlife. So, so the first Culver's that they opened was in Western Cedar Rapids. Yeah. So, so Southwest side of Cedar Rapids. Um, so we're talking 1998, 99. Um, it was the, uh, the third Culver's restaurant in the state of Iowa at the time. Um, you know, so, so they, they just picked up from, from Makokota, moved to, to Marion to start that, that venture. And, uh, thankfully again, um, going back to Brad, right. They, they partnered with Brad Lowhouse. Uh, so he was a big part of the financial picture, um, at the time for them to, to go do that. Um, and then a couple of years after that, they decided to do another location in Hiawatha, which is, you know, part of the Cedar Rapids area. And, uh, you know, they, they, they manage those two restaurants for a while and that is, it's hard. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I tell the story when, when talking to individuals, uh, anybody that wants to, to go start their own business, right. Um, for whatever reason, the restaurant world is, is where people gravitate to. And I don't know if they go out to eat, they have a good experience or they go out to eat and they see it's busy and they think that a bunch of money can be made. Uh, rest, the restaurant world is, uh, is not easy. Um, and, and so, it, it, again, it goes back to I'm glad that, you know, they part of the franchise model. Um, we wouldn't have been able to succeed if we weren't part of a franchise model to have that support. Um, but, yeah, the two, two, two locations um, in, in a relatively short amount of time. And then shortly after that is is when, you know, my parents, um, being the good parents that they are, they, they didn't force any of that on me, even though they could have used help. They said, Jake go to college, Jake, go, go, go do the corporate world thing. Right. Um, and they let me do that. And I think I learned, but what I really learned was that's not who I was. Right. I didn't want to do the corporate world. I wanted to, to be a part of a family business, be close to the community I'm in. And so that they, they, they did all the right things as parents, um, which then opened the door for the opportunity that, that I've been doing for the last 18 years. Talking about when you start a Culver's, uh, a couple of questions about Culver's in general, but uh, talking about the process your parents had to take before they opened a Culver's, like did, didn't they have to go to some sort of like Culver's University, basically, where they have to go to Wisconsin for so many days and, and learn the process, talking about what they had to go through before they could just open up yeah. a Culver's restaurant. Well, and at the time it wasn't, but today it's called Butterburger 
university. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, it, the, the Culver's model, again, this is what was allowed Culver's, I think, to be very successful is um, it's a it's a locally owned owner operator model. And they're not interested in people who maybe have experience or maybe just have the financial backing to do a restaurant. They're interested in people who can manage the restaurant and be the owner owner and operator. And so part of that process, um, you know, my, my folks, but my father in particular had to go through a, you know, an 18 week program. And it was, it's not glamorous. They intentionally put him through the, this is what it's like in the restaurant world. And if you can't cut it through these 18 weeks, then that's a pretty good signal for, for us as a company, but also you personally, that this isn't a good match. Um, you know, and, and, and Culver still does that today. Um, that would, that they require, a, a, a an owner operator to be engaged in that particular restaurant. And I think that's what sets, you know, yeah, we, we play in that fast food area and space with, you know, the big players such as McDonald's, but what sets us apart is there is somebody that's truly engaged on a daily basis that cares about the team, cares about the, the customers, the guests. Um, and, and I think that's the recipe that that's, that's given them given us the the greatest uh, difference between some of the other competitors. Yeah, I'm going to give you a second here. Tell me why Culver's is better than the other fast food restaurants. Why do you think it's better? Well, I mean, what I just said is 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 probably the the, the key reason, the people and in and, and how that how that culture all comes together. Right. Um, you know, but it is certainly all the way down to the food um, is it's just different. Um, you know, the food that we bring in the back door, the food that we prep the, the, and how we, how we make it is, is more similar to a traditional restaurant. Um, you know, and so ultimately though, the experience, um, the food always has to be good. There's, there's some, some food that isn't prepped or made that way. That's good. Um, I think what makes us different, I mean, it's the people, the fact that, you know, we may not always get it right, but I promise you we care. Um, and we care enough to try to make it better. And, and I think that that says a lot. There's a lot of places that don't have that. So that one Culver's in Cedar Rapids and then the two Culver's now in Hiawatha. And at this point in time, we're 45 years old. You where your parents started, you know, this 25 years ago. Uh, you guys own seven. Is it six or seven Culver's now? Um, so, so, and this is what, what's part of what I truly love. Um, I, I'm associated with nine restaurants, um, through, through, um, you know, what my, my family, we directly own and operate, but just like I, I, I talked about the, that Culver's model. So we have partnerships. Um, we have partnerships with other individuals, um, that, that they're now the owner and operator and giving and working with them through that opportunity. That's, that's, Oh, that's so fun. Um, and, and so that's my primary uh, motivation and, and focus right now is, you know, running, trying to do our best to run good restaurants, but trying to go and, and create opportunities for others, you know, similar to me. Um, and, and we have some good stories to tell. So it's, it's nine restaurants over um, over three states. And, you know, surprise, surprise, I'm not um, never was the get me in the kitchen, be the restaurant guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I enjoy people and thankfully people is is the huge part of our business one of your more recent additions to the uh stable of, of culver's he has own is up in michigan uh talking about you going to michigan years ago uh now at this point in time you have a, a second home up there uh, a cabin uh near torch lake i want i want the, the listeners to uh, hear what Torch Lake is all about. Uh, and then, of course, you guys add that, cul that Culver's, but really I want to talk about Torch Lake. I I've seen pictures online. Uh, describe Torch Lake uh, for our listeners. Yeah, I, well, um, when when you start to have a connection up there, you're, you're, you're told not to talk about Torch Lake because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you don't want to let the, the, the secret out. But uh, you, so it's eight and a half uh, hours for, for me to drive. And um, but it's worth every, every, you know, every minute on the road uh, to get up there. I mean, for, for individuals who have not been to uh, Northern Michigan, the, the Western side in particular um, in, in the lakes, not, not just torch, but there's lakes everywhere up there. The quality of those lakes are um, different uh, is, is really the only way I can explain it. Uh, but they call torch the, the Caribbean of the Midwest and rightfully so. 
And so just uh, a couple of Google searches on, on, on images. And, and I think if anybody's not familiar with it, I would highly recommend they become familiar with it. Yeah, the, the lake, uh, when, you, when you go to those images, it has a sandy bottom. And as we all know, growing up in the Midwest, you don't get too many sandy bottom uh, lakes. And so most of our lakes or, or ponds are, are mud bottom and they're sort of not the greatest thing to look at. Torch Lake looks like you're in the Caribbean. It's got that light blue water. Um, it just does not, uh, it, it does. It almost like doesn't make sense. Obviously there was some sort of, probably some with the glaciers uh, or something back in the day that created it. Um, do, you, do you know why the, the lake is that? It, 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 it has a limestone um, and mineral in the water, limestone base and, and those things together is what makes the, the, the clarity, the color um, of the turquoise and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, and what's on top of it just being gorgeous. I mean, you know, from from where we're at, where we grew up in eastern Iowa, right? If you, if you were to go to a, a lake, right, there's some in Iowa that are pretty good, or you'd have to go down to maybe the Ozarks. Um, we're talking a whole nother story on 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 what the lake is like. But then uh, on top of it, it's not busy. Um, you know, it's just it, it, to be able to go up and experience it and, and kind of have the lake to yourself at times. Unbelievable. The best Culver's menu item for you, for me, it's the cheese curds. I love cheese curds. I could eat bags of cheese curds. Uh, what to you is the best uh, uh, menu item at a Culver's? Well, and, and you make pretty good cheese curds at home. So so for you to say that is, is something. But, um, you, you know, I... I I would, my favorite and, and what I, what I recommend to anybody, you just got to go with the double butter burger, cheeseburger, right? Burger. Um, and, and you, you got to get it in a wrap to where it kind of seals in the juices, gets the cheese melted the way that the bun comes together. I don't care what toppings you put on it. And quite frankly, having it plain is, is, is probably just as good, but the, the, you got to get a double because you got to get the two patties, the two pieces of cheese, the way it all comes together. Um, so the, the double cheeseburger and, uh, you know, ultimately you just got to go with a scoop of custard with a little hot fudge and uh, pecans uh, on the top. For, for our good buddy, Hanstock, who, who likes pecans, um, you always got to have a little salt uh, with, with the dessert. You definitely do. Yeah. Uh, now that you have, of course, you left Makoka a long time ago. I left Makoka a long time ago. We don't get back much. Talk to me about the difference between living and growing up in a small town and now raising your kids in a bigger city in the Cedar Rapids area. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's as a parent, right. You question everything that you do. Um, you know, try to try to figure out, are you doing the best you can for, for your family? And, and that's probably one of the biggest things that I, I will go back to, you know, I'm very happy and content. I mean, Mary and Iowa, I mean, it's not, it's big, it's bigger than Makokota, but, um, you know, just the opportunities that we had, I, I wouldn't change how we grew up for anything. And I, I would imagine the majority of people, whoever um, ends up listening, would, would, would say the same. Right. Um, but I can honestly say that um, if I could replicate my experience and give it to my boys, I absolutely would. And they have a great they have a great scenario yeah. now themselves. But on the same token, Sage, for all some of the things we talked about. Growing up um, in, in that town and in the individuals and the families, I mean, yeah, you you and I were good friends, but I was also really good friends with your parents, you know, in in in, in your brothers, and that's just the way it was. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't change that for anything. I think that is a big difference between the small town. You know, I grew I live in the suburbs, big high school, about four or five hundred kids a class uh, here in West Omaha. I think that is the biggest difference is. Um, you know, I have uh, some of my, my kids' friends, parents that I know and some I'm sort of friends with, but I think the aspect of that multi-sport, right? Your, our, our dads coach basketball together. Our dads coach against each other in Little League Baseball. Our, our dads sat next to each other when we were playing football. Our dads, right, they were, our, our, the, the parents are around each other a lot in multiple different sports, sharing rides, all those things where now it's just so much this one sport and you don't get to meet other parents in town as much or rely on the other parents. I feel like as much, you're just relying on like that one parent too, that lives near you to uh, shuttle rides with and things like that. I think there is something special about the uh, 
uh, the small towns compared to big cities or even just like suburban America that you just get to know people so much better, right? When, uh, when, when my dad needed to go get a suit, he went to your grandfather's Kendall menswear store. You truly knew each other. He didn't go to a men's warehouse uh, or uh, some other uh, shop that serves a huge community. You really knew the people that you were buying products from or who was servicing your car or whatever it might be. And I think that is the biggest difference between that small town and a city even Omaha size to, or to bigger cities like Chicago or Minneapolis or, or, or New York is that that connection versus a sort of disconnect. You, know, you go to New York, you don't really have any relationship to the people that you're uh, hiring to, to fix something in your apartment or uh, to the bartender that you go or, or the, the waiter at the restaurant. But in small towns, you do. And I do miss that. I do miss that sort of personal uh, uh, connection that I'll probably never have. I don't know if I ever end up living in a small town, uh, but the big cities are, they are, they're more impersonal uh, where the small town like Makokota, uh what was very, very personal. Uh, I have to get back there. What, what are the, what are the best, give me the best two things for those. Makokota is between Dubuque and Davenport. It's on highway 61, about 30 minutes each way. Um, it's sort of a in-between town. You, you could probably say, right. A lot of people, they they some people work in Makokota, but they might live uh, somewhere else. Or they they live in Makokota, but they might work in Davenport. Uh, talk to me about like your two or f- three favorite things about Makokota in the Jackson County area. Well, um, you know, for any anybody that's going to visit, you got to mention Obi's uh, Tacos, right? Um, so that's always been uh, something that Makokota maybe is a little bit more known for. Uh, so so anytime I go back, I make sure to to try to work Obi's in and, and it's, it's not only good, good greasy tacos, but it's like you get your bill and it's like nine fifty or something like that. Yeah. Right? And it just, it makes you feel like, okay, Makoka is okay. Um, so, so that's, that's certainly one thing, but I, I, I think it's just a, a combination of all the things we've talked about, right. You, you go back and you still have those feelings. And, and I know that that's what, you know, pretty much anybody's hometown is going to bring to them, but you know, you have those special connections with pretty much every corner of that of that community, that town, right? You go out on one particular gravel road or whatever, and there's a memory attached to it. There's a memory attached to everything. And that's that's the part, again, you know, going, going back to your question, you know, what what maybe our kids are experiencing versus what we got, the opportunities we got. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that, that, that they're going to have to create their own experiences. Um, but it's not going to be quite the same as what we, the luxury that we have. Yeah. The Makokota Caves, by the way, for those who like the outdoors, Makokota Caves might be, it might be the coolest thing in Makokota. I mean, I, and I meet people just from Iowa. It might be from Des Moines or Cedar Rapids, Quad Cities, and they've been to Makokota for these uh, pretty cool Makokota Caves, which are about five or seven miles uh, outside of town. So Obi's Tacos, Makokota Caves, two of the better things. Uh, in, in town, in yeah, town. The, the, the list isn't overly long. Um, so but we'll just focus on those two. <laughs> yeah, no, there's not any James Beard Award uh nominees or, or winners currently setting up shop on Main Street, but uh, yeah, that town has really changed over the years. You know, my mom, my mom grew up in Makokota, um, your parents, uh, as well, and and you know, going this is going back to like the 60s, our your our, our uh, uh, uh parents were in high school at the same time, not in the same class, but at the same time, they sort of knew who each other were. And then small town America. Uh, and, t- and then we both said, we both, we both we'd go other places. Um, I know you're a busy guy. You have a lot of employees uh, to, to deal with. You have a lot of burgers to <laughs> butter burgers to, to, uh, uh, to dish out and, and cheese curds, of course. Uh, Jake, I really want to uh, say thank you uh, for, for coming on the Sage Rules and Fuzz experience. You've gotten to a, have the stage rules of experience from a different perspective, I, I feel like, uh, going back to our childhood. And, and uh, I, when I did this podcast, I always wanted to have sort of random people uh, from my past or, or my present. Uh, and, and it started off with Kenny Main, one of our favorite guys from, from Sports Center. And it's I've had Ricky Williams on and, and uh, uh, Billy Corbin, a documentary director. And, and I really wanted to have uh, you on. And I think I'm going to have Hainstock on, too. Uh, our friend Mike is a pediatric uh, heart surgeon. And one of these days, 
one of these weeks we're going to have him on too, because I'm super fascinated by what he does. Uh, you're literally saving lives every day as you're pushing burgers and I'm over here doing podcasts. Yeah, all, all, all American boy. Uh, like I told you, I, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, asked me to maybe jump on before him. Uh, but no, it's it, truly an honor. And, and I, I love the fact, I mean, the Sage Roosevelt's experience, the name experience is, uh, does fit you very well. Um, you know, I, I think every time I, I get a phone call from you, um, my first thought is, is, you know, excitement. Uh, I get to talk to Sage, but the second one is, is where is his mind at now? It's, it's not even where are you at? And, and you do a lot of things physically, but mentally, where is uh, Sage Roosevelt at? And, and I, I just, I mean, such a good friend, um, you know, and, and just like in high school, I never really realized um, maybe how athletic um, you were. And, you know, it's very similar today, right? Um, you, you've stayed true to that. And you know, that's, that's pretty cool. And so I, I appreciate, I don't know uh, how many people are going to be interested in our conversation today, but uh, I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, I will definitely get a note from my parents. And then that's to me, probably all that really matters. Uh, they're my favorite listeners. So uh, Jake, I really appreciate you, uh, you coming on today. Uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing you soon. We'll have to link up uh, somewhere, maybe back in Makokota, maybe at an, for an Obi's taco. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Kendall, thanks for coming on. This has been the Sage Rosenfels Experience on the Iowa Everywhere Network.